Good morning. I've got another stream going on today. Alrighty, it is day 25. Uh, later on, I'll be doing day 26 of the 28 days of study. Uh, today, we're going to kick it off with a hand reading practice, range versus range. Um, then we'll get into lessons learned from a podcast interview uh, with Dr. Patricia Cardiner. And there's a the link right there. I sent it out in yesterday's email as well. And what can I take with me into my next session uh, from this interview right here? Some questions I'll ask myself. Then later on, we'll get to some game tape um, after another hand reading practice. So two sessions to Today. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me. I am just going to share this with the Facebookers and the Twitters. I wonder how many people come from the tweets or from the Facebook once I send out these messages. Ah, no idea. Cool beans. So we're up and running. We are live. Let's do some hand reading practice. So today we are doing hand versus, I'm sorry, range versus range practicing. Um, and I mentioned it at the outset at the very beginning, but I haven't talked about uh, hand reading practice in general. And I always start every single uh, study session, whether it's streaming here or or just on a study session when I'm not streaming, with a hand reading practice. I always find a hand that went to showdown. Um, an old one or a new one either way because I often forget what my opponents have in hands I just don't have a good memory for hands themselves you hear stories people talk about oh this hand I played five years ago he opened with this and he had this on the turn the board was this the river was this he bet this amount I don't remember that stuff ever I just do not have memory for hands so I can see um, I can do a hand review on a hand that happened four days ago and I completely do not remember it um, unless there's a lot of emotion uh, tied tied to it uh, so that can happen but hand reading is just such an important skill the more you practice off the felt the more you can take uh, the lessons learned and those strategies when it comes to hand reading um, take your understanding of ranges and boards and how ranges hit boards and equities all that stuff the more you practice off the felt the easier it is to take that stuff onto the felt so you can make better decisions while you're in game playing a hand versus your opponent. So that is why we do all this. Uh, that's why we do this hand reading every single day. So I recommend for your own study sessions, even if you don't do a study session, just whip out Flopzilla and uh, Poker Tracker 4 and just do one hand reading for like five or 10 minutes a day. Just do that. You'll be so much, uh, your skills will improve big time for it is what I should say. Oh, so once again, we're looking at full ring, uh, full ring games, because we we get we've gone through a ton of the uh, six max games. Saw showdown yesterday. There weren't. I'm looking for bigger pots, you know. Did we do this pocket queens? Bet bet, and then what happened on the river? Oh, we got it all in on the. Mm, that's a small pot. That's not consider that let's look at some winning hands again pocket kings I think we did that one. Oh, three of a kind threes three of a kind kings as well bet 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 let's look for a different line somewhere Bet, 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 call, right there. Bet, 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 check, raise, check, bet. That might be interesting, a check, raise line. I don't think we've looked, ah, oh, it's a win. Okay, no, let's not go there. Okay. Check, raise, call. See, what I'm looking for are carbon hands, because as the winner on carbon, I can see check bet check interesting so scary board but we ended up winning let's see if we can't uh, put our opponent on a hand right here see why we played it a little bit passively on this one so we've got our two flopzilla windows tie that to that Cool. And we use hold EQ to tie the two windows together so we can see equities here. We've got all of that going, plus we have this bad boy here. Four of 
four eight. Queen Queen in the small blind. Let's see what happens here. Who our opponent's going to be? Get an open to 64. Come in for a good three bet right there. Not n enough really. I don't want to scare them both out. I wouldn't mind one of them folding, but it'd be really good to get. Uh, I guess he's got a full stack, but he's super loose passive. Either way, I do want to see a flop here with queens. Okay, so we get one caller. So we get an open and a call. What is our range for three betting is the first question right here. So queen, queen, the small blind. We three bet squeeze and get an out of position caller in the pre-flop. Uh, we get the pre-flop opener calling out of position cool no in position whoops he's calling us in position buttons right there okay so our preflop range in the small blind what are we three betting here in the small blind over two players one of them's a tight aggressive player versus the passive. I am often tens are normally my cutoff hand right there for the three bet. So I would say uh, that makes sense. Tens, ace, queen. I like three betting ace, jack. I like three betting these just as a bluff right there. Um, if I was dealt any suited connectors, I'm probably calling to go multi-way and try to hit a good flop here versus an opener and a caller. Um, but these ones I like to throw in as three bet bluffs. Ace Queen offsuit is a good three bet bluff hand. Ace Queen suit. Yep. So this is my this is my three bet not three bet bluff but semi bluff with the Ace Queen. Um, uh, these are my kind of value top end stuff, and then there's my bluffs. Uh, I could throw in stuff like this, but most of the time I won't be I won't be three betting those kinds of hands. So there's my three bet range, nice and uh, tight with a little bit of bluffiness thrown in there. Seventy-eight combos and five point eight eight. Hmm, pretty tight range. Makes sense though. It's a three bet after all. But what is he opening and then calling with? Let's take a look at some three bet calling ranges. A nitty range. Uh, or the hand. So it's going to be. Mm, it's not super difficult. Well, we can't really use stats so well because we only have 28 hands on the guy. Uh, so we just have to use an estimation. We know that he's pretty much on the tight aggressive side at an 18-11 player or being an 18-11 player. So what is a tight aggressive player? Let's give him this right here. Um, first off, 18-11, actually, let's do this. Let's start with this. So what is he folding here and or what is he calling? And you got to keep in mind that there's another caller right here who could have position on him on the button. So he called knowing someone else is still acting here. So let's remove some of this stuff. He's pretty tight overall. These are four betting queens. It depends. I mean, he's he's in position. He might just call with queen, so we'll keep that in his range. Ace king, ace king. Let's keep those in his uh, open and calling range as well. Let's say he's calling with those. King jack suited. King queen. Let's keep king queen off and then king jack suited in as well. Ace jack off. Hmm. Yeah, let's keep ace jack off in. I'm not a big fan of it, actually. I don't know. I mean, if it were me, I'm folding ace jack off suit here. But that's just me. Let's keep it in. Whatever. Uh, sixes. Let's say he's calling sevens or better. Okay, so this is a pretty, pretty decent range right here. I think 116 combos, 8.75.
tightish range because of a player still to act. Great. So let's see what happens on this flop. Jack, six, seven, all hearts. Ooh, not good for me. So on this flop right now, with our entire range, we have 52% equity. Not too shabby at all. I mean, things are looking pretty decent here. It's a scary flop. Uh, he doesn't flop a ton of flush draws with this range. Let's look at that real quick. So on this range, or with his range right here, his flush, flush draws are basically 14% of the time he has a flush draw. Sure, he has some suited stuff, but he has plenty of suited stuff that are just not hearts, you know, the spades, the clubs, the diamonds. So it's not like we can automatically put him on uh, on a flush draw at this point, um, or even the made flush, of course. Uh, so we've got to be C betting here, I would think. Um, I don't like checking behind. I mean, I don't know anything about the player, but if he checks to me, I've got to be betting here. Oh, so on the jack six, seven, all hearts. Our range's equity was... Our range, 52 versus 48. 52 versus 40. Once again, you can get this uh, this sheet from splitsuit.com slash templates. It's a pay what you want for it kind of donation thing that he does. So let's see what happens here. So we check. You know, I would have preferred right here a bet, even though I'm out of position. I would have preferred a bet. And then he checks behind. So what am I checking on this board uh, from my range first off? I am checking... I'm going to check my flushes because I just I just hit a miracle flush and look at all of my flushes are basically they're all ace high flushes, right? Where's the flush? Yeah, they're all ace high flushes. So, I have no reason to be scared of this. Sure, there's a straight flush draw possibility, but whatever. No reason to be scared. I'm checking my flushes to give him a chance to hang himself. So, those are in there. My sets? Mm. Oh, only a set of jacks. Yep. Um I like betting sets, although I would check them because it is it's a it's a tough board to hit for the most part for him. I'm not too scared if I have a set of jacks right there. I have a redraw to a flush. So I'm, I would possibly let him hang himself with a bet and come in for a check raise right here. So I like the set uh, two pair over pairs. Um, yeah, I'm checking especially if I don't have a heart in my over pair. I could be checking those right there, which I obviously did because I have queens. Um, Overpair with the flush draw, we could take those out because I I like overpairs with flush draws as bets because um uh because I have the overpair I'm getting equity but I also have the flush draw out as well for uh, better than just an overpair for actually hitting a flush and with those overpairs it's um an ace a king or a queen of hearts. Um, if I'm on the flush draw. So I would not I would often not be checking those. I would be going out and, and leading out there to try to get value now out of the guy before the fourth flush card hits, before I can't get any more value. I would be doing that right there. Uh, top pair, no, no, no. Pocket pair below top pair? No, I'm good with not betting, uh, with, with checking. I would be checking that right there. Ace highs? Mm. Oh, those are the other ones. Yeah, I'd often be checking. I'm out of position in this instance. Yeah, so you can see I kept 100% of my range in. I'm checking all of my made hands as well as all of my complete whiffs right here because some of them could be check raising uh, and he just doesn't know it. He checked behind, so he doesn't know what I'm actually, what my goal was at this time. So my range. Wait a second. Cancel. What happened? I don't know what happened. Did I de-click something? I don't know what ha I don't know how that range disappeared like that. I missed it. Anyway, okay, so this is my range, 100% the exact same range right there. Um, 75 combo, 6.4%. 
Oh, that's what happened. Dag nabbit. Okay, I click right here and that, that screws up the range. Okay. So don't click there. Click over here. Good. Um, and then so he checked behind. What is he checking behind on this board? Whoops, don't want to see that yet. Definitely checking behind flushes just to lull us into a false sense of security. Not always, but but sometimes he is. Checking his sets on this scary board, Jackson 7s, in position. I think he's betting for value there. I really think, or not value slash protection in case another heart comes. Um, uh, he could be slow playing though, because we just don't know anything about it. We'll keep the sets in for now. Let's see what happens on the next street. Um, over pairs, just pocket queens. I think he's betting those. I think he is. Yeah. Uh, the f over pair with flush draw. Yeah, I think he's betting. I don't think he's checking either of those top pairs. He could be checking top pair. We're going to keep some uh, flush draws in his range down here. So, uh, top pair with flush draw. Now, I guess I could see top pairs checking. Top pair with flush draw checking as well. Top pair with no flush draw checking. Nope, top pair. Hmm. Just, you know, as I think about this, I always... Uh... Oh, Positive Poker Insiders asks, where is Patricia Cardner? Uh, it's just a study session. So he asks, where is Patricia Cardner? It's just a study session, so I'm learning from an interview with her after the hand reading right here. So thanks for the question, Al. Uh, let's see here. So what is he checking right now? Top pairs, flush draw, no flush draw. Okay. Pocket pair below top pairs, those are checking. Ace highs, possibly checking right here. He's a tight aggressive player. He might not be making a move just yet. Um, flush draws, nut flush draw. Those are possibly checking. They don't have to necessarily bet this one street. He could uh, try to see a free turn at this point. Yeah, so really by my check and then his check behind, um, we weren't able to, to limit uh, his range hardly at all. 103 combos, 8.76. So that's one of the things, our check with his check behind limits his, uh, no, our check with his check behind uh, doesn't allow us to remove many hands from his range. So this is something to to take in mind when you're aggressive in your hands. Uh, you can you can absolutely remove um, when you're aggressive in your hands. Your opponent's actions tell you more about their hands. If I would have bet here and then he just calls, that tells me a lot more than just his check behind. His check behind could be a lot of slow playing and stuff. When he just calls, he's probably folding on such a scary board like this. He's probably folding a ton of his whiffs, just calling with his made hands as well as some of his uh, uh, some of his best draws as well. So checking him, checking we we didn't limit it that much, which is a bummer. Oh, thanks, Al. Uh, let's see here. So the four of spades hits. Now, of course, that doesn't make anything on either end. You know, it doesn't help our range, doesn't help his range either. On the four of spades, we have 54% equity. He has 46, of course. Now my turn range. What happens here? I'm out of position. I hope I bet now because he checked behind. Good, I bet. And just a half pot bet. That tells me I'm more on the scared side. I could be going for value here as well. So before we see his action... Um, oh, I did it again. Paste it in here. 
Great, so my range is back again. 54% equity, I gotta stop clicking down there. So um, let's see here, what is my range? So I'm betting just a half pot here. I'm either going for value or to bluff. I mean, it could be a big, a really big part of my range because uh, he checked behind the turn. So I'm not too scared, especially when that four hits doesn't do much of anything. Um, betting the flush, betting the straight, betting the sets, yep. Betting the over pairs, yep, definitely betting the over pairs now. Um, a heart did not hit, so I'm not scared, you know. Pocket pair below top pair, the tens. I could see those betting right now, just trying to take the pot down. Uh, middle pairs, weak pairs, no. The four, uh-uh. The ace highs, uh, no. Uh, let's not bet those. I'd probably just check those again on the scary board because I have no redraw because most of those ace highs are, um, like, you know, ace five of spades or something, which does not have a redraw to a flush. Uh, so I wouldn't be betting those. The nut flush, I would be betting here. Second nut flush, third nut flush, I'd be betting. What's the third nut flush? Oh, the queen of hearts. Okay, yes, be betting those. Weak flush draws, let's not bet those. Uh, open ender, I don't think I'd be betting an open ender here. What's my, what's an open ender? Just a ace five, oh yeah, no, I wouldn't be betting the open ender. Okay, so that's it right there. So we've limited ourselves, 60.8 and 74 combos. Oh, I clicked right there again. I shouldn't do that. All right, so what is his range? Let's see how he responds to my bet. Oh, he just checked calls. Or not check calls, just calls. He's got position on me. So when he calls on this four of spades board, what's he calling with? I think now, what's his stack? I think this guy was the one with the full stack to start. If he has a flush, I mean, he's got to be raising right now, right? Because he's a tight aggressive player. He wants my stack. He wants to double up through me. This is the time to raise. I mean, don't wait for the river when you have a flush. Uh, I don't I don't think so, at least. Sets should be raising as well, so I can't put him on those draws. Two pair, over pair, over pair queens? I guess queens without a heart, like my hand right now, could just be calling uh, in hopes of a heart not hitting. So we can keep those in his calling range for sure. Top pairs, possibly just calling. They're not that strong, uh, Just, but it is only a half pot bet and I showed weakness on the flop and the four doesn't necessarily make a, a good hand. I could be bluffing and then he could just have a jack and calling at least this one street. Pocket pair below, top pair, nope, those are all folding. Ace highs, no. Nut flush draws are calling. Second nut flush, third. All the various queen of heart hands, those are calling as well. I don't think the nut flush draws are waking up with any aggression. A nut flush draw uh, had the, had a chance to get aggressive on the flop, which is where they would have normally got aggressive with. Um, so I don't think if he still has a nut flush draw, I don't think he's uh, getting aggressive here with it. So let's just say he's calling. Open ender, no, or not calling. Weak flush draws, no. Okay, so we've narrowed with our bet. We are able to narrow it down just a little bit more to 42, uh, 42% and then 103 combos. Good. Okay, so at this point, now that we've narrowed this range down to this, uh, he only has 32% equity versus our range. Our range is so much stronger. Even though we checked behind, or we checked ahead on that flop, um, uh, our range is still stronger. Great. Four hearts comes. Ugly card. Nobody's happy with it. Well, he might be happy with that if he had a flush draw. Because we did put plenty of flush draws in his range right here. Uh, four hearts hits. We're first to act. We check. And then he checks. Oh, so it's a little bit uneventful of a hand. Um, well, check, check. Probably just keep the keep the ranges the same. Well, what, what What's happening here? What am I checking here? I'm not checking full houses. I am not checking the nut flush, nor the second nut flush. Um, not checking. I mean, I guess I might check the fourth nut flush and the third nut flush. Yeah, for second, first nut flush, second nut flush, checking. Over pair, checking. Okay, so my checking range, I've actually narrowed it down quite a bit right now to 73 combos and 41%. Forty-eight percent. Forty-eight 
or turn. Okay, so 67% was our equity. Okay, but now that I checked, we only have 46% equity, so his range is better than ours. He should bet here on this river um, because if he thinks about his own range, he totally has a flush draw the whole time, playing it passively, checking behind the flop, calling the turn. Now that the river hit, he should be betting right here to try to scare us off, definitely. So our range is pretty darn narrow here at only 18 combos. Forty one per cent. A river range. Very narrow and weak as we're not betting for value on this scary river. All right. So their river range here. Uh, what do we got here? For their river range, he just ends up checking behind. So he definitely had doesn't have the nut doesn't doesn't even have the third nut flush um, I guess yeah that stuff he'd be checking top pair checking behind yeah so if you look at it I mean 43 percent only 18 combos man his range is super narrow as well I mean we've narrowed it down big time I doubt he has one of these hands I'm probably <laughs> incorrect in my hand reading here um, it would be nice if I was right I just doubt it though. So as it stands right now with our two river ranges, we are our equity is 100% because we just we just beat his range fully, and he has a just weak top pair hand that he decided to to get to the river with. So let's see what it ends up being. Ace Jack. All right, it's in his range. Good. So we started started him off with a pretty narrow range and then narrowed it down. It was ace-jack suited, so right up there. And so good, we narrowed him. It was success. All right. Took him down, even though we showed a lot of passivity. He showed passivity too. Um, his hand makes total sense that he would have that ace-jack. Um, nobody likes with an ace-jack really betting the flop. He should bet it there. He has position. Try to get me to fold if in case I do have some kind of heart. Like I could have had pocket tens, nines, or eights, fives at the time fours i mean i could have had so many random hearts that he could get to fold with that top pair top kicker hand um on the flop so he misplayed it i misplayed it as well by being a little bit too passive uh, on the flop and on the turn i like the pre-flop uh pre-flop action you know i got one of the two players in still but yeah pretty good hand right there so that was a successful hand reading happy to see that 15 out of 21, pretty decent. Success, good. So next up, um, we'll talk about lessons learned from an interview with Patricia Cardner on High Roller Radio TV. That's this bad boy right here. So High Roller Radio is my first experience with them, um, but I really like the interview. He did a great job. And uh, one thing that he does on his videos is he puts all these pictures up and um, and like, what is it? Like you can see, it scrolls in and out. When I do my YouTube videos, my podcast as a YouTube video, it's just the the episode image, which is pretty boring. I guess you could just play it and listen to it with my podcast, and some people do that. But his his videos, he makes it a little bit more interesting by actually um, putting pictures in and uh, just moving around on them. You know, so throughout the interview, as she was talking about different things, um, he would put up screenshots of whatever, talking about the WSOP, talking about her book. All that stuff. So I think I can take a lesson from that and hopefully possibly up up my YouTube video game. By game, I don't mean video game. I mean what I do on YouTube, you know. So anyway, lessons learned from this interview is a really good interview, only 20 minutes long, short and simple to the point, though. Um, and uh, and uh, she talks some really good stuff. So she discusses first about Chip Reese. In her book, uh, she mentions Chip Reese as a perfect example of a great poker player with awesome longevity in the game, as well as being able to just, uh, well, longevity in a game where he's playing against some of the best players in the world. And he's so 
He's a great example of that. He credited his success with rema remaining in his A game when his world-class opponents would devolve into their B and C games. And, you know, no tilt and no C game equals winning. And that's what Chip Reese represented. So that's that's the kind of, that's one of the reasons why we're doing this entire week on studying the mental game and studying, uh, you know, assessing and um, preventing tilt because it's such an important thing to stay in that A game. If we're able to stay in our e A game as our opponents play longer and they devolve to their C and B games, we're able to take advantage. We want to be the Chip Reese of whatever we're playing, you know, 25 NL, 6 max, 100 NL, whatever we're playing. You know, we want to be there always in our A game. Opponents get to their C game, we take their money. Um, she also talks about three aspects to playing great poker, and it's being a triple threat. One is technical. You need to have the strategies down. If you understand the game of poker better than your opponents through study and lots of time on the felt, you've got a leg up on them. That's the first part of this. The mental aspect is the next part of being a triple threat poker player. The mental game is an extremely important part of successful players. The strategies are important, you know, the technical aspects, but a good mental game allows you to use those strategies at opportune times and just all the time. Yep. And then the third part of being a triple threat poker player is the physical aspect. So physical fitness allows you to remain at the tables longer as well as remain focused. Being in good shape also helps your brain operate more efficiently. So hopefully when you're in good shape, you'll be... Uh, You'll be learning more through your studies. You'll be able to pay attention more at the tables, and you'll be able to sit there longer and be able to play with those players as they, as their mental, I don't know, facilities, I don't know, faculties, as their mental game starts to decrease. They get their B and C game. You're remaining in your A game longer than them. So that's the goal here. That's what makes you a triple threat. The technical skills, the mental game skills, and the physical skills. Yep, yep. So um, she also talks about routine is very important. The host of the show, High Roller Radio, asked her a question about routine, and then she just talks about it being super important to achieving your goals. A routine of study, play, exercise, eating healthy, meditation, sleeping, all of those things makes it easier to do the things you know are good for you. Uh, routines help you develop, uh, develop habits. And actually, I should say good habits. And that's something I talk about in my book as well, developing good habits here. Let's actually zoom in a little bit, make it easier for you to read. Cool beans, all right. Uh, let's see, she also gets into downswings. Now, downswings, they happen. We all know that they happen, and they can lead to spew and even more losses. You need to keep in mind why you're playing, your visions, and your goals. If you hold your why close to yourself, this can help you remain calm and continue to play, because in the long run, your skill will win out. But it's super important to not lose any more than necessary when you're running bad. When you always hold that why, why am I playing? You know, I want to make money, I want to improve my skills, I want to beat the competition, I want to... Uh, uh, whatever, I want to build my bankroll. When you hold that close to the vest, you're more able to remain focused and keep your goal, well, as you keep your goals in mind, that will help you to maybe course correct and avoid tilt because you're playing for a higher purpose. You're not just playing right now to beat this one opponent. You're pay playing to beat the game of poker, to achieve your overall goals. And that should help you to stay focused and uh, hopefully tilt free at the tables and in your A game. Uh, one thing that she says it's very important is the cards have no memory. Patterns aren't real. It's just our brain and our biases working against us. So so when you're on a downswing and it feels like every time I hit my set, he hits his straight, or every time I hit my set, he hits his flush, or every time I have pocket kings, they hit a, a crappy two pair with nine seven, whatever the case. Those are just patterns that your brain picks up on. And it's very important, just like the roll of the dice in craps, um, the, the cards and the dice, they don't know what happened on the hand before. They don't, they don't have any... <clears throat> They don't have any memory. And so that's why it's so important to avoid tilt, to just realize that, hey, this is variance. This negative stretch that I'm in is variance. Things will turn around. I just have to play as best I can to work through this variance. Eventually, things will get better. Um, but the cards aren't working against you. The dealers aren't working against you. The online sites aren't working against you. Um, it's just when you notice those patterns and everything feels like you're on a downswing, on a downhill slope, uh, it's just... It's just a part of the game that you need to work through, and uh, it's your brain thinking of those things as being real when they're when they're really not. Uh, the turn of the cards are just the turn of the cards. Everything is random, but your plays are what matters. 
And uh, she also talked a little bit about her students. With her students, she puts them on healthy routines, you know, like gym and then study, etc. And these things, or not partying as much, she talks about. And these things often yield good results and build confidence for even more good results. So those are you know those are the the things that i learned from her interview really quick interview but there's some great things that we can take with us from this interview into the future now a lot of the stuff that i'm about to mention you know what can i take with me into my next session um it's stuff i'm doing already right now but i'm going to list it out here so that um well some of the stuff i'm doing already uh but in case you've never thought about, you know, hey, what can I do to up my mental game? What can I do to to be a better technical player? What can I do to get healthy and have a better physical, be physically fit, I guess I should say. What can I do to, to do those things? I'm going to list this, a lot of the stuff I do here to help me develop good habits, you know. So, we'll just, we'll, we'll just start from technical, of course. So I do study every day one hour, as you guys see right now during this whole thing. Um, and I have a plan when I study. Yep, so don't bounce around in your studies. Stick with one theme per week. Just imagine, okay, in the past four weeks, you've seen me tackle three different themes, and I studied different stuff every single day during each of those themes, right? So I spent a full week on each of those and a full week right now on the mental game. Just imagine if you did that for an entire year. That's 52 topics where you spent seven hours per week studying that one topic and really diving in, working on it in your play sessions and trying to um, instill all of those things you're learning into your game. So let's say you, you did that, 52 topics really in depth well that's way better than like 150 topics uh just randomly throughout the the course of a year so i really recommend study one hour every day and have a plan when you study for sure and you know one topic per week yep 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 uh the three so when it comes to the technical game is So I don't know if uh, anybody saw, but I did a, a, a streaming play session yesterday. And in that session, I talked about my warm up. And this is the thing I, uh, and I'll dive into the warm up more tomorrow. But my strategy focus for yesterday was stealing and re-stealing at every opportunity. So, well, you know, every cutoff, every button, every small blind and big blind, I thought about, is this a good opportunity to steal or re-steal? I thought about that every time. And I did pull off a pretty, uh, a few good steals and re-steals right there. So put what you're learning into play. So next up, let's think about the mental game. Now, some people don't like meditation uh, or some people have never tried it whether you've tried it or not I recommend giving yourself a week or two weeks of just meditation every day between five to ten minutes just download a meditation app on your phone um, and just just hit it there's calm there's headspace for your phone um, there's there's quite a few others right now I use headspace myself uh, and then so you could do that you can also find just mp3 um, in the iTunes store you can download what do they call just meditation mp3s where somebody's talking you through meditation for five or ten minutes um you could just do it on your own you can get a book on meditation whatever just meditation is a great practice um try it for 17 to 14 days and see if it helps you at all uh, meditation just starts to make you calm makes you think about uh, well, just just helps you to remain calm and at the tables. That's one of the big things We don't want those emotions to cloud our logic centers and to prevent us from uh, Employing the strategies we we know we should employ and that when you remain calm at the tables You're better able to access those logic centers right there. So meditation is key for the mental game also read 
listen to the mental game of poker and whoops peak poker performance so i have them all of my books are hard copies i can't do ebooks um so i have them on you know hard copy i also have these on um audiobook as well so that's why i say read or listen the mental game of poker peak poker form performance there's other ones out there and i highly recommend just just learning about it even if you don't do a full week of study on the mental game just reading the book and learning about it will go a long way towards helping you just be more cognizant of how important the mental game is you'll start to realize hey i'm going on tilt right now what led up to this tilt Oh, hey, ex existential war. Hi, nice to see you. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, you'll, you'll start to realize what led up to the tilt, and then you'll be able to start controlling a little bit more just by reading these two books. You know, And then this one is the one from Dr. Patricia Cardner. Uh, really good. I haven't finished it yet, but so far, really good. Uh, the third aspect to the mental game is to... Um, uh, I guess, yeah, that's what I want to say. Focus on it in your warm-up. So, part of my warm-up and cool-down we'll talk about right now um, is, of course, my A, B, or C game. Before a session, uh, you know, I want to play. And so I'm going to play no matter what, oftentimes. I think to myself, geez, what mental state am I in right now? Am I in my A game, B game, or C game mental state? If I'm in my C game, if I have a lot of crap going on and I'm unhappy or or whatever I often won't play but if I'm in a or B game mindset I will play but I purposely think about this before I start my session it just helps me to focus and if, if I know where I'm at I can try to do things to get myself out of that C and B game uh, in order to be in my a game so I can play better and another thing logic statements so these are things from Jared Tendler's book the mental game of poker these are things that help you to stay focused as you're playing and to help avoid tilt when you suddenly encounter a tilting situation let's say that you know when a fish sucks out on you with a flush on the river or a straight you know that puts you on tilt uh, so when that when that happens and you realize hey this is a tilty situation you refer back to your logic statement it's okay my skills will win out in the end the fish got there to on the river when they shouldn't have been in they should have folded on the flop or the turn they gave me value on the flop or turn which is great but that allowed them to hit the river uh, which is a bummer but my skills will win out in the end I know that I'm a better player than them if I just keep playing with this player eventually that whole stack will be mine you know so logic statements help you to stay off tilt and another thing thing I do is I'll record right here any tilt that I occurred yesterday in that session I had zero tilt even though it was a losing session I played really well I kept my focus um, and I avoided tilt even though some bluffs didn't go my way and some hands that I had great hands like a uh, what was it ace 10 offsuit versus a total donk he would pot size bet every time he had a really good hand well the flop came ace <laughs> 4-4 four, four, something like that I don't remember but I had a top pair hand with a decent kicker and the guy started pot size betting the flop and turn well I realized because I was paying attention I was focused on the game I realized that his pot size bet equals strength he thinks he has the nuts when he's pot size betting so I simply folded my top pair good kicker hand um, because I'm sure he had ace king or even pot, pocket aces for a set something like that and I didn't pay him off so even though situations like that happen I avoided tilt yesterday it was a good day. Um, a warm up and cool down. And then the last part was, of course, the physical aspects of being a triple threat. So, exercise daily. I do this now. Um, but uh, I want to do it a little bit more. I exercise roughly 10 to 15 minutes doing kettlebells, but I need to do a little bit more. Um, sleep more, of course. Last night, what, six hours of sleep, but uh, uh, the night before like five hours like I need to sleep seven plus hours this is something that uh, I always say that I need to do this I should do this but I end up just being loaded with so much stuff to do that sleep kind of when I have a lot to do poker play is the first thing that goes out the window if I have to get tasks accomplished do a podcast do a live stream for a study session whatever it is poker play will be the first thing I take away from the next thing I take away from is my sleep um, so I need to sleep more I need to not take away from that I need to get more sleep because I know that I'm more focused and more able to get stuff done in the day when I sleep more uh, and then of course part of just being physically fit is um, 
for me, I'll just say healthy eating. Now this simply means for me, this is this is my own self. Uh, no, no grains at all. So no breads, no rice, no sugar or very little sugar. I even stopped putting sugar in my coffee because I just want to cut back on the sugar. I know the sugar is no good for me. Um, healthy eating and green smoothie. And I do this every day for lunch. Daily green smoothie with a little bit of protein as well, of course. Um, so like a pork chop and a green smoothie, you know. Um, hey, Existential War just followed. Thank you very much, Ex Existential War. Good to see you. Uh, good to have you. Smoothie. What is wrong with that? There we go. Okay. Cool beans. So these are just from this simple talk right here. Um, or a simple interview with Dr. Pat Patricia Cardner. She talked about a lot of great stuff, right? Well... Thinking about what she said just a little bit more in detail, I'm able to come up with nine different things that I should be doing on a daily basis uh, in order to up my game and to become more of a triple threat. So I recommend you make a list like this for yourself of things that you should do daily. You know, I made a three by three list, nine things total. Um, and, uh, and I need to up my YouTube video game as well. So there's 10 things of me, uh, or. There's 10 things that I can take into the future with me uh, to become a better poker player, better person, a better a better uh, uh, smart poker study um, podcaster or brand, you know, on YouTube, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, these are 10 things just from this one interview. Uh, listening to a 20-minute interview, I came up with 10 things that I can implement in my life to start uh, to become a triple threat and to rock it out more. Alrighty, well, thank you very much, everybody. I will be coming back later with a game tape review, um, another hand reading practice, and then a game tape review of some game tape I recorded yesterday. Alrighty, I am out of here. Time to get the kids ready for school, make them breakfast and stuff. So take care.